as is Basra, which was just appears now to really be in coalition hands. And uh, General Myers was pointing out that we hoped that the eastern part of that population, Shiite city, a Shiite part of the city, excuse me, would indeed roll over to our side when the time was right for them. And remembering again that the western part of the city, a lot of that is Sunni, Ba'ath Party, very loyal to Saddam. So if we're seeing, if we're hearing right, uh, and again, the Iranians are Shiite, and they're, they're probably embedded in there in that Shiite population, we may well be seeing that that part of the city is rolling to our side. I would expect uh, any Saddam loyalists, loyalists over there, Fedayeen or, uh, or a Republican Guard, Special Republican Guard, whatever, at this point their lives are in dire danger. They'd be throwing down their guns, getting rid of their weapons, and trying to uh, make their way back across to the eastern, or the western side of the city or meld out into the population somewhere. Let's mm -hmm. hope these reports are true. Yeah, let's hope that. And, and Colonel, what do you make of this? I, I was just really reading this uh, straight off the wire that, that's coming from this Kuwait news agency saying that some of the uh, Saddam loyalists are being forced to leave the city. Uh, others are, are leaving their positions and changing into civilian clothes. It sounds like anybody who's still loyal to Saddam Hussein is just scrambling uh, the heck out of there. Where can they go? They're, well, they're in big trouble. Again, Bridget, I think they would want to slip over to the western side of the city, which is Sunni and probably still uh, pretty loyal to Saddam. But back in 1991, when the Shiite population in Basra rose up against the government, uh, they massacred, they, the Shiites, massacred a lot of uh, Saddam's people, uh, the Ba'ath Party loyalists, the Sunnis that were down there in the military garb supporting him. So all these people up there in that Shiite section of Baghdad probably well remember what happened down there in Basra don't want to be a part of it and so they're fleeing north south or east but probably or west that is but probably not going east because if they go east they're running right into more Shiites and more trouble for them all right Colonel Cowan I'd like to ask you to please stand by as we continue to uh, monitor these brand new developments right now I want to throw it back to John Scott in Doha in Qatar John well, that's right, Bridget. Thanks very much. We're checking to see if there is any uh, reaction to these reports here at CENTCOM. Obviously, this is a situation where the media are, are very often the first outlets of this kind of information. And as you say, Bridget, uh, these reports coming to you from Kuwaiti as well as uh, Iranian media of this uprising in uh, Baghdad. That's the kind of thing that the Pentagon had hoped might happen, uh, assuming that a certain amount of control can be kept. You heard talk from the Pentagon of the prospects of Baghdad falling from within with very few shots being fired. And with those first incursions by U.S. military uh, uh, units going in there today, it seems clear that the folks of Baghdad know the Saddam Hussein is no longer in control there. Uh, let's check in with uh, Oliver North, who is with the Marines just on the outskirts of Baghdad, for his perspective there. Colonel North. John, uh, the news of uprisings in Baghdad is being meted with great, being meted, being met with great applause by the Marines here on the east bank of the Tigris, right across for the river from Baghdad, and of course that's what, as you said, Secretary Rumsfeld expected. There is now an internal uprising inside Baghdad, and of course what we don't want to do is get in the way of it. Standing beside me is Captain John Jasky, one of the helicopter pilots who. Just a few hours ago, with that helicopter behind us that had been damaged yesterday by enemy fire, went up and took down a forward observer. One of the questions that everybody asks is, where are the bad guys? Well, the bad guys have, as you pointed out, largely taken to the opportunity of getting into civilian clothes or trying to escape. In addition to Chemical Ali, the 5th Marines also report that they confirm that they have killed the chief of staff of the Special Republican Guards. He tried to escape with his driver, and his driver and he, and unfortunately his dog, met an untimely demise. And John, if we've got a second, Captain Jeske, tell us what that means to be at the banks of the Tigris for the third time, getting ready to cross. You can hear the airstrike over our head getting ready to come in. What have you guys been up to? Yes, sir, we've been busy. Uh, as you mentioned, they asked us to, a uh, uh, regiment came out and said, we've got a forward observer point that we need you to uh, isolate because we're sending Marines in there in a uh, urban environment to uh, capture the uh, forward observers. We uh, launched immediately, went up overhead, and uh, circled the, uh, the site. Once we circled the site, we isolated it. Uh, nobody could get in, nobody could get out. And uh, what that allows us to do is be eyes in the sky for the guys on the ground, talking on our radios, telling them what we see, so that when they get into the compounds, 
they're not uh, being surprised by anybody hiding behind a door or a wall. John, one of the great advantages the Marines have is you've got pilots like Captain Jasky standing right here next to me that I've been flying with the last several days with HMLA 267 and the uh, Kazavax with HMM 268 with that CH-46 behind us, working very closely hand-in-glove, air and ground together. Captain Jasky, anybody want to say hi to? I'd like to say hello to my dad in Sun Prairie, Wisconsin, and to the rest of my family spread out through the world. All alive and well. Yes, sir. Uh, John, I would also tell you this. The, the rumor is that as, so, as soon as things break up, start to break up inside Baghdad, the 7th and the 5th Marines will be there to help make it happen. John, back to you. All right, Oliver North with the Marines along the banks of the Tigris River there, just on the outskirts of Baghdad. And just to recap the information that we are hearing, according to not only the Kuwaiti news agency, but also the Iranian news agencies, uh, popular uprisings are taking place right now in the city of Baghdad, a city that uh, just this morning the Iraqi information minister was saying was totally under Saddam Hussein's control. He went up to the roof of the uh, hotel there and said, look around, do you see any of these U.S. tanks? No, they're not there. That at the same time that U.S. tanks were just a quarter of a mile away. Uh, the information minister obviously living in a world of delusion. But uprisings apparently taking place right now in the city of Baghdad, large sections of it uh, coming under a uh, civilian revolution, I guess you might describe it. Our Bill Cowan is keeping an eye on things as well. Bill, I, I guess this is what the, uh, uh, what the Pentagon had been hoping for when it said that Baghdad could fall from within. Sounds like it, John. Uh, we, again, uh, this is early reporting, as you know better than I, and I, so we have to hope that indeed uh, this is true. It will be interesting to see what the information minister has to say. I think Air Marshal Burridge said uh, he's taking the word denial to a new, uh, to a, let me look at my note here, to a bizarre dimension, and that's true. Uh, he may be saying uh, that we're not there while indeed uh, the walls are crumbling right around wherever he is. One nice thing, if indeed this is true, that we now have Baghdad residents rising up, what that does is, and again, I'm assuming it's off to the east in the Shiite section, that's going to relieve pressure on the missions that Oliver North and the 5th and 7th Marines have. If they see that part of the city really falling into friendly hands, those forces can now really be applied more heavily in concert with the 3rd Infantry Division towards elements, uh, enemy elements off to the eastern side of town. It really means the war planners down at CENTCOM, where you are, are going to have to be moving quickly to help develop yeah, a whole new scenario for our concept of operations as the western, eastern part of the city, excuse me once again, uh, appears to be falling. Back to you in terms of the camera. Still here, John. I'll keep, I know we can't quite right. hear each other. I'll, I'll keep going here by saying one of the other things that Ollie pointed out a little bit earlier, which I thought was important, uh, he, again, he's talking to this young Marine there. We now have a lot of helicopter activity over Baghdad, which we did not have a few days ago. We know we've got jet aircraft. They've been running continuously, but those helicopter aircraft now, such as that young Marine Ollie was talking to, the ability to get those helicopters up in the air, working closely with ground troops, really expands your ability to move out in the battlefield. Now you've got eyes and ears right above the battlefield. Uh, they went up and looked for a forward observer. That is an enemy Iraqi who was looking down on them and trying to call enemy fire on them. Uh, they go up, they knock out a guy like that. It's a perfect example of air power working side by side with the ground troops and really managing our ability to move quicker and more efficiently even throughout an urban area. All right, Lieutenant Colonel Bill Cowan, Fox News military analyst. Thanks very much. It is a very happy day here at Central Command in Doha, Qatar. Uh, not only are there these reports, which they have not confirmed, but we're getting them again from the Iranian and from the Kuwaiti news agencies that popular uprisings are now underway in the city of Baghdad. Ordinary citizens apparently taking on the Fedayeen, Fedayeen Saddam and the other forces of Saddam Hussein. That going on right now. Meantime, the folks at Central Command have been able to confirm some very positive military steps. And my colleague David Lee Miller is here uh, with more on what we heard in not only the British, but also the American briefings earlier today. David? That's right, John. Just a few moments ago, we heard from Brian Burridge. He, of course, is the air marshal speaking on behalf of the British forces here. And he described the last 48 hours as nothing less than historic. He said that the Ba'athist regime in Basra is finished. Those were his words. 
He says, though, that there is still some resistance, and he said the resistance that they are seeing appears to be coming from uh, what he referred to as the souk, which is the old part of the city. That's the uh, old market, and that's a potential problem because the streets there tend to be very narrow. Uh, the buildings are very old. It might be difficult to bring tanks down those streets, and it could could result in some of the hand-to-hand -hand combat that uh, we have heard talked about. He also emphasized that uh, it's really a ragtag uh, sort of uh, uh, paramilitary that is in this souk, in this, in this area of Basra. He said it's a bunch of paramilitary units comprised of the Bast Bathist militia and also the Fediyin. And he uh, did not mince any words when discussing who the, uh, the Fediyin were. He referred to them as the lowlifes of Iraqi society. He also said, though, that progress is being made to uh, eradicate Basra of these paramilitary units. And he said some of that help is coming from local Iraqis. Let's listen now to his words. What is striking, and you know that you are making progress when people, local community, people that you haven't nurtured as sources come to you with information. And that is happening in Basra, overwhelmingly. And human intelligence is the most vital resource in knowing what these paramilitaries are doing and knowing where they are. He also said that liberation does come with a price. In the last 48 hours or so, three UK troops have died. Several others were wounded. And since the conflict got underway, he said 30 UK soldiers um, have died in this effort. Uh, a number were killed in action, others because of accidents. But they have all indeed paid a heavy price for the liberation of Iraq. And finally, John, uh, he was asked during the news conference, as we expected, what about Chemical Ali? And as we've come to expect, there is no definitive answer about Chemical Ali's fate. His bodyguard has been killed. His home, yes, had been struck by coalition aircraft. But there's no conclusive proof, 100%, that he is, in fact, dead. Although he did say that what he referred to as open source reports, uh, newspapers and, and uh, what you might refer to as, as really rumors, people in that community, though, who, who would really know what's happening, believe, in fact, that Chemical Ali is uh, no more. It's apparently not going to be easy to identify him as a victim because those airstrikes with probably 2,000-pound bombs would have pretty well incinerated and reduced to rubble much of what was in that building. So you might not be looking at an entire corpse, for instance. Well, that, that's a very good point, although, on the other hand, they were able to identify his bodyguard. So. To what extent Chemical Ali's remains might be intact if, in fact, he was in that house, it's, it's still too early to tell. We were talking the other day uh, with one of the British officials about the possibility of DNA testing, and that, that's a possibility, too. But more and more, people do not view, people, uh, the Iraqis do not view Chemical Ali and others like him associated with this regime as a threat. And I think that's the single most important message to come out of this, that uh, whether or not he survived or not really is inconsequential because the regime is all but dead. David Lee Miller, thank you. Yeah, and uh, that word appears to be getting around Baghdad, as we've been telling you. According to uh, IRNA, the Iranian news agency, and the Kuwaiti news agency as well, we're not talking about Western news organizations here, but rather organizations that have very good sources inside of Baghdad. A sort of a popular revolt is underway in Baghdad, several neighborhoods there. At least 35 of Saddam's military people have been killed in this popular revolt. That is the latest uh, that we're getting here at Central Command, live in Doha, Qatar. Uh, let's go back to New York for more. All right, John, and from Baghdad, we want to take you south once again to the city of Basra, the second biggest city in the country of Iraq. And we're hearing that the uprising apparently is underway there as well. The Associated Press is now saying that Iraqi civilians have been turning on the people who had remained loyal to Saddam Hussein in Basra that the Iraqi civilians have been now attacking militiamen along with uh, looting a state bank as uh, British troops, as we've been telling you, have continued to take control of that city. Uh, there has still been sporadic fighting, although it would seem that uh, the coalition forces are largely in control of Basra. Uh, they had still some work to do in the older portions of the city, a lot of winding roads, a lot of uh, narrow passageways there. So the British forces have actually been going in there on foot to try to clean up uh, the rest of 
Basra. But again, Iraqi civilians turning on those loyal to President Saddam Hussein now in the Iraqi city of Basra. Colonel Cowan, uh, it, it's tough to tell uh, what what's happening first. It, I think when the, this all started, we expected uh, Baghdad to follow Basra. Uh, and now it almost seems it, maybe it's the other way around. Well, yeah, clearly, uh, Bridget, and it seems that uh, the, the Shiite population there in Basra now has absolute confidence that the British and coalition forces are there to say, not only in the killing of Chemical Ali, but now the British have started pushing really into the city. And they're, it's interesting, their role now in that city is going to take a little bit of adjustment. It's going to go, the British forces, that is. It's going to move not only from fighting the Fedayeen, it's going to move to also trying to stabilize that population because those people are going to want to rise up they're going to want to take out retribution on the uh, Saddam loyalists, and we really don't want to see a lot of pictures of Saddam loyalists hanging from light poles and having their entrails spread around the streets of Basra. So this is a very dicey situation. The Brits are involved in multifaceted operations here, and on the backside of all that, of course, is a humanitarian effort. So it's so complex what's happening inside that city. Uh, one humorous note I did here this morning that the looters, somebody had looted the grand piano out of the Sheraton Hotel and was pushing it down the main street of Basra. So there's a little humor mixed in the seriousness of the war. Uh, Colonel, I have less than a minute uh, left right here, but what do you suppose happens next in, in Baghdad itself? Where's Saddam Hussein in all this? Uh, you know what, Bridget, what's going to be interesting, if, if this words of uh, the people turning on the Saddam forces is true, uh, we're suddenly going to be inundated with information, with people rushing forward. We can't, you can't give enough credit to regular civilians being willing to rise up and attack these Fedayeen forces or attack Saddam military. It just takes incredible bravery, but it also demonstrates the hate and anger and suppression that they've been under for so many years. So we'll support them as much as we can without a doubt. At the same time, they're going to be coming to our forces with so much information on where Saddam may or may not be, on where forces are, on where enemy this is, where enemy that is. Our folks in, uh, in Baghdad, our troops, are really going to be busy now. They certainly are. Colonel Cowan, thank you so much. I ask you to stand by again. And as we uh, get ready to take a quick uh, commercial break here, just want to leave you with the very latest information from Baghdad. A couple of media outlets now, Iranian media and Kuwaiti media, reporting that the city you're looking at is now the scene of a popular uprising. Baghdad, popular uprising in several residential areas of that city. Apparently, dozens of Fedayeen, the Saddam loyalists, have been killed in what some sources are calling bloody confrontations. Uh, some of the regime's security elements are said to be abandoning their command centers. Also, a popular uprising would seem to be underway in the southern city of Basra. Our coverage continues in just a moment with John Scott, live from Doha, Qatar. Uh, strangely enough, at, at a late stage, I know the, the leader, uh, Ahmed Chalabi, has, uh, has been lobbying for weeks uh, uh, kind of to get into the battle. He was, and these troops were based up in northern Iraq. Uh, they've now been brought down here uh, to, you know, to help the Allied forces. Um, there's been meetings today, for example, with some of the local tribal sh sheikhs. And one of, you know, one of the problems in, in, in really, uh, <clears throat> okay, capturing a city, and you, you, you're then going to stabilize it, is there's quite a few people who, who are still nervous that this is an American occupation. Uh, this force puts a, a, you know, an Iraqi Arab uh, face to the efforts. They can go around and, first of all, know who's the good guy and who's the bad guy. Uh, they've got an extensive network in the south and also in Baghdad, and um, and kind of uh, help uh, assuage people's fears that they're, you know, that they're going to be under occupation. This is an Iraqi Arab force. Uh, it is the only Iraqi Arab force, of course, there's the Kurds in the north, um, working side by side with the coalition. So it's not just a military aim. It's also a kind of political aim to, to stabilize as quickly as possible the uh, areas that have, that have essentially been... Uh, freed of at least the Iraqi regulars. Well, clearly the kind of uh, help you're talking about is welcome. Have you had the opportunity to talk with anybody that, that is a part of the coalition about their expectations for these freedom fighters? Well, we've got an American colonel attached, uh, sort of a military attache to this uh, Iraqi, Iraqi uh, freedom force, um, rather like the Free French and De Gaulle. There's also 120 Special American special forces um, based here with uh, with the Iraqi opposition group force. Um, they're going to go out in operations, um, you know, say guerrilla operations, 
They're in units of 56. There'll be uh, about 12 special forces on each Iraqi operation. So it's very much under a sort of independent Iraqi Arab force under uh, American command and control. So there's no contradiction there. Ray Colvin of the London Sunday Times, thanks so much for giving us an update as you are outside of Nazaria. Once again, describing the airlifting in of some freedom fighters that help, who will help bolster some of the coalition forces. Let's get to the headlines right now, straight away with Heidi Collins at CNN Center in Atlanta. Good morning, Heidi. Good morning, Paula. Here's what's happening at this hour. A show of force in Baghdad. More than 100 U.S. tanks and armored vehicles rolled into the heart of the capital city this morning. The troops seized Saddam Hussein's presidential palace in downtown Baghdad. The American forces are using the palace compound to hold prisoners of war. There are reports of U.S. casualties in the battle for Baghdad. Army sources say an Iraqi missile struck an operations center south of the capital. Two American soldiers and two journalists were killed. Fifteen others were injured. And CNN's Martin Savage says two Marines were killed by Iraqi artillery fire in southeastern Baghdad as well. Martin Savage also says U.S. Marines have taken the headquarters of Iraq's Atomic Energy Commission. Savage says they found unidentified substances in jars and protective suits and masks. A team of experts will conduct a more extensive search. In Belfast today, President Bush will discuss post-war plans with British Prime Minister Tony Blair. The two are at odds about what role the United Nations should play in post-war Iraq. The President and Mr. Blair also will discuss peace efforts in the Middle East and Northern Ireland. Coming up on CNN, much more on the U.S. grip on Baghdad. Tanks and armored vehicles rolled into the Iraqi capital, but coalition troops are meeting with some pockets of resistance. We'll have the details on that. And after the regime falls, we'll talk more about rebuilding Iraq. Plus, getting supplies to the Iraqi people. We'll have the latest on the humanitarian efforts. All that and much more ahead right here on CNN's coverage of the war in Iraq. It continues right now. Good morning. Welcome. Glad to have you with us this morning. I'm Paula Zahn, starting off a brand new week here. America has sent a very powerful message to Saddam Hussein. U.S. troops drove deep into Baghdad today. They knocked over a statue of the Iraqi president that stood over the parade grounds, a very important uh, symbolic area to Iraqis, and they took over his main presidential palace. Army sources tell our Walt Rogers that the troops will not leave some of the positions they have taken today. Now, while the battle for Baghdad is far from over, a lot of attention is now focused on what happens when the war is over. As Heidi Collins just reported, President Bush left Washington this morning for Northern Ireland for his third meeting with Britain's Tony Blair in as many weeks. Blair is expected to try to convince the president that the U.N. should have a prominent role in post-war Iraq, something uh, that the Secretary General of the U.N. just stated uh, at the top of the hour. Time now to go back to Kuwait, where my colleague Bill Hemmer is standing by. Good morning, Bill. Paula, hello again on this Monday. Countless developments right now as we move toward evening here in this part of the world. Northern Iraq first stop. Uh, Kurdish leaders there celebrating after hearing reports that the man known as Chemical Ali is dead. British officials say that, that Ali Hassan al-Majid was killed in an airstrike in Basra about three days ago. Uh, CENTCOM says it cannot confirm that report. The British are saying if the local commander said it in Basra, then apparently it is true. Nonetheless, Al-Majid is the man accused of leading that chemical attack, directing it anyway, on Kurds 15 years ago that killed about 5,000 people in northern Iraq. An airstrike also in that part of the country knocked out an, an Iraqi ammunition dump in Mosul, sending huge fireballs uh, into the sky. Jane Araf also saying that U.S. Special Forces and Kurdish fighters knocked out uh, uh, the road along uh, Mosul and Kirkut in the north. Uh, more evidence that coalition forces are being welcomed. Walter Rogers tells us uh, with the 37th Cavalry west of Baghdad, he says Iraqis now are starting to come forward and tell that unit where they can find missiles, where they can find tanks. And even Walt told us earlier today uh, that locals are helping them locate um, uh, the electricity and the power banks at the airport west of Baghdad. And one other thing, just learning right now, Paula, Tommy Franks, uh, head of CENTCOM down in Qatar, apparently made three different visits in three different locations today alone Monday uh, to U.S. troops operating in Iraq. Again, that word just in. Not much more detail after that, but we'll try and track it down for you, let you know what we find out. 
Thanks, Bill. We're going to try to get a better idea of what exactly is going on now at the Baghdad Airport. Lisa Rose Weaver is there. She joins us now by telephone. Lisa, good morning. Good morning, Paula. Well, from where I am, about 10 kilometers away from Baghdad, at the perimeter of the airport, I can hear fairly consistent and sometimes very heavy artillery off in the distance. This is nothing that I can see, uh, but I can hear it. Meanwhile, I am with an air defense unit which uh, uh, has arrived here. It's set up. It's intended to protect the airport itself, particularly from Scud missile attacks coming from outside Baghdad. Uh, at, at some distance so far, nothing uh, of the sort has happened. Earlier, uh, I was with a, one of the security captains here as he uh, looked at some uh, abandoned bunkers we don't know how long ago the Republican National Guard left these bunkers. They apparently did leave in quite a hurry. There was a lot of unused ammunition, uh, clothes left uh, haphazardly on the floor, even a couple of gas masks and uh, some food items. Interestingly, they found baby formula, which uh, the military here is speculating may have been what the guards were eating for nutrition. Uh, apparently, all they, all, all else they had to eat were bread and potatoes. Obviously, no way to confirm that, but some very interesting details uh, that the Republican National Guard left behind. Paula, what else can you tell us about how long, uh, and, and without violating any rules here, how long you might be in place there, and what the goal is in the next couple of days? Well, this is uh, the beginning of a fairly, uh, fairly permanent presence by air defense in the area to, again, as I said, it's, it's designed to protect the airport itself, the area outside the airport, from attack uh, from outside the airport, because uh, Patriot missiles need high trajectory. They need to be at some distance uh, from an incoming missile to uh, really intercept it. Uh, in the next coming days, uh, this air defense will probably be uh, debolstered. Uh, and it's quite interesting that they've come this far. It is unusual for Patriot missiles to operate so far, uh, rather so close to the front line. You're, they're usually static. They don't move around very much. These missiles have driven into this country 300... <laughs> We are losing our signal with... All right, we paused for a second there to see if we could get Lisa Rose Weaver back. Bill giving us an excellent description of what is going down now at the airport and some of the efforts that are taking place to make sure that the airport is not vulnerable to some missile attacks. Yeah, Paulo, also want to, um, not only in Baghdad right now, but also in Basra right now, we continue to get more reports, right, about how the British are essentially rolling into the center of that town and also setting up shop as well. Uh, Bill Neely is a reporter for ITN. He filed this story a short time ago, in fact, a few minutes ago, about what's happening there with the British. A new dawn in Basra and Challenger tanks rumble through the ornate gates of the main presidential palace. The assault on Iraq's second city is less than a day old. The tanks and the marines behind them aren't stopping. This was said to have been the headquarters of the Fedayeen, Saddam's paramilitaries, but locals have told us that the palace is now empty of Iraqi soldiers. The gates are open, so we're going to walk straight in. They push forward across the most symbolic ground in southern Iraq. This palace, the seat of Saddam's power here. Power that the marines are smashing away. Different building, different way in. If a hammer won't do, try this. It is the Marines who hold power now in Basra. The next task, to hunt down the men who fought and defended this city for a fortnight. The Marines were convinced that if Saddam's men were to make a final stand anywhere in the south, they'd make it here. So orders were hushed. Right, you two, straight in first on the left. Go. Just 12 hours earlier, a soldier with another unit in Basra was killed by a booby-trapped bomb. So they moved cautiously through a dozen echoing buildings. Move up, down and Sam, yeah. 
Building by building, floor by floor, and there are a lot of them here, the Royal Marines are clearing this presidential palace where Saddam Hussein has stayed and slept many times in the past. The Marines only too well aware that he may have left men behind here to ambush them. But they found little inside, ornate bathrooms, but no people, no furniture, nothing for these looters who the Marines rounded up. In the grounds, just a few abandoned weapons, discarded helmets and uniforms. They even left behind the weapons they might have fought a guerrilla war with. The tanks poured in, but here at the presidential palace, not a shot was fired. Not so a mile away. We dived for cover as Marines opened up on a target. A man had stolen a jeep from the hospital. Doctors shouted warnings to the Marines as he sped towards a tank. Marines, believing he was a suicide bomber, shot him. He died later in hospital. They're taking no chances here. In all, three British soldiers have been killed in the assault on Basra. In the centre and the south of this city, Marines now control the streets and bridges, backed up by 20 or more tanks. Saddam's power is being torn away. The fall of Basra, the beginning of the end of his brutal regime. Bill Neely, ITV News with 4-2 Commando Royal Marines in Basra. Also, we're hearing, uh, getting word anyway, that humanitarian aid may start flowing into Basra at any point. Uh, perhaps tomorrow, perhaps later in the week, no clear indication, but the Brits again earlier today reiterating the point that they want to get food, they want to get water, they want to get the massive amount of supplies they brought to Iraq into that town ASAP. We'll talk more about the humanitarian crisis, uh, what's come of it in other parts of Iraq with an expert out of Jordan about what concerns them right now. We'll have that for you right after this. Tomorrow at 7.42 a.m., a once-in-a-lifetime business deal will arrive in this office. Command into Tommy Franks, who's, who's run the war effort there. Bush still has a yes or no decision, but Tommy Franks will take the initiative and run the, the uh, timing, the force mix, the strategy, and so on. Hussein's the opposite. He's, he's very, very in control, and he is the decision maker um, all up and down the chain of command. So if he is alive, or if he is still engaged in the government, there's several contradictions that come up because from the day one there has been no coherent Iraqi strategy. Um, you, you know, you look at World War II and in the end of the war, even as Germany was losing, he took advantage of the weather situation in December 1944 to launch an attack in the Ardennes and off-balance the U.S. and British and Allied forces then. And, and that showed that he was fully engaged. Hussein has had several opportunities, one of them being the sandstorms, where he could have taken a strategic initiative and launched attacks. He hasn't done that. So even if he still is alive, it leads you to some questioning as how in control he's been because the military has had no guidance from a strategic level. Well, it seems as though his time can be measured in days, if not hours now. George yeah. Dew, former CIA agent. George, thanks very much for being with us. Thank you. I'm Eric Shana, Fox News World Headquarters in New York with the very latest on Operation Iraqi Freedom. Allied forces deep in the heart of Baghdad capturing symbols of Saddam's crumbling regime. As we've been reporting on all morning, now both Iranian and Kuwaiti media saying that Iraqi citizens rising up against and killing Iraqi soldiers in Baghdad. At least 35 members of the Fedayeen reported to have been dead as the Iraqi citizens seem to be taking their revenge on Saddam's regime. Earlier this morning, the 3rd Infantry rumbled into the center of the Iraqi capital, arriving at downtown Baghdad, briefly surrounding the Information Ministry, the Al Rashid Hotel, and other important sites. The pinpoint lightning incursions prompted resistance from Iraq's special remaining Republican Guard, the paramilitary Fadiyin gunmen, and other informal militia. They fought back using rocket-propelled grenades. Heavy bombing and shelling has been heard in Baghdad, that ongoing. The U.S.-led show of force meant to send a message and not to occupy, and maybe some of the citizens now getting that message. Fox's Greg Kelly, who's with the third ID inside one of Saddam's presidential palaces, Two of them were taken by U.S. forces, our troops using Saddam's bathrooms. 
occupying the parade grounds where he once reviewed his troops. They also took down more Saddam statues, blowing one up, a defiant Saddam on horseback, no more. Despite this, the fighting continues. The presidential palace from where Greg was reporting was shelled earlier. He is fine and reporting there's a battle ongoing with a multitude of airstrikes on Iraqi positions. A U.S. communications center in South Baghdad was hit by an Iraqi missile. Two Marines were killed. Two journalists also died. One was from Germany, the other from Spain. No idea at the moment pending notification of Ken. Also today, weapons of mass destruction may have finally been found in the city of Hindaya. It's just south of the Iraqi capital. That, according to the Reuters newswire. Chemical weapons teams now working to confirm that the suspected stocks are indeed sarin gas. It's a deadly nerve agent that has been used by terrorist groups before. Meanwhile, in Basra, in the southern part of the country, the British say that that Iraqi city is now under their control as Iraqi citizens also turning on those loyal to Saddam Hussein there, attacking militiamen and conducting rampant looting. The Brits trying to positively identify bodies found in the bombed-out house of Chemical Ali, who of course was Saddam's infamous cousin Ali Hassan al-Majid, responsible for the gassing of the Kurds, killing thousands on his orders. Sources on the ground say that he indeed is dead, the British now trying to confirm that. Meanwhile, it has been a day of historic progress for coalition forces, but officials cautioning difficult days still lie ahead. While some Iraqis are waving, others still shooting, the military campaign continues. That's the very latest. Up to the second, I'm Eric Sean. And as we get ready to take a quick break in our coverage, just a reminder of what Eric and John have been telling you. Again, word of an uprising now in the Iraqi capital city of Baghdad. You're looking at it live. Iranian media reporting that at least three areas of the city of Baghdad uh, has been part of this uprising. Kuwaiti media reporting the same, that several residential areas are the scenes of uprisings. Dozens of the Fedayeen, the Saddam loyalists, have been killed. And Iraq's leaders are said to be changing into civilian clothes and fleeing the city even some of the regime's security elements have been abandoning their command centers. And our coverage with John Scott in Doha, Qatar, continues in just a moment right here on Fox News Live. So we're ready here in Jordan and in other countries in the region to receive them. Now, David, uh, let me just be a contrarian just for a moment here. What do you say to those who say uh, that the aid organizations prior to this conflict uh, blew the refugee crisis out of proportion? No, it's, a re it's the responsibility of particularly the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees to ensure that systems are in place to care for people who do cross borders and become refugees. They expected, they planned for uh, substantial numbers. In the event, those numbers have not materialized. We don't know why, but it was their responsibility to be ready. So there was no uh, uh, exaggerating the importance of the issue, they simply took their responsibilities ser seriously, and they still do, in case there are refugees. All right, David, thanks. David Wimhurst and Amman Jordan with the UN, thanks, and best of luck to you and your organization there and your work going forward. Here's Paula Thank in you. New York. Thanks, Phil. U.S. officials say it sends a powerful message to the Iraqi regime, but from a strategic standpoint, how critical is the taking of the presidential palaces to the coalition? For more on that, we're joined from Colorado Springs by Colonel Mike Turner. Always good to see you. Thanks for staying with us this morning. You bet, Paul. From your perspective, what does it mean that this presidential palace has been secured militarily? Well, it's a major step, Paula, in securing the hearts and minds of the Iraqi people. Our goal right now is as rapidly as possible to communicate to the Iraqi people that the regime is dead, that it's gone, that they can, they can breathe easier, and that aid is on the way. Any trapping of uh, social infrastructure or governmental uh, building that we can secure to indicate to them uh, conclusively and in, incontrovertibly that the regime is dead strikes a psychological blow within the civilian population that we want to convince them that that the regime is dead so by taking that palace it's a huge symbolic act uh, the image is just of that alone lead civilians to I mean that one image will counter virtually everything the information minister may try to do today or tomorrow or in the next few days so it's an enormous uh, it's an enormous step forward in the, in the psychological war that's going on right now 
I know making timeline predictions is, is often uh, kind of a dumb thing to try to do, but I'm just curious if you think in this case this in any way reveals how much longer it might take to, to install a new government, the taking of this key presidential palace. Well, I, I think it does, and I think it's, it's fair to say at this point that I obviously don't know what the schedule is, and, and I'm sure we won't be told by the, by the military commanders, nor should we. But I think it's fair to say that that with U.S. forces now operating with with not impunity, but but in a fairly aggressive way in downtown Baghdad, and then the capture of these key buildings, uh, the, uh, the 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 death of the of Chemical Ali, uh, I believe it was yesterday when that occurred. All of these things now are occurring at such an accelerating pace, and, and, and again, we see this cascading effect of the collapse of the regime, and now it's a race to convince the civilians, uh, we don't want a vacuum here. We don't want a, a social infrastructure vacuum. That's one of the reasons we've secured Baghdad International so quickly, and we've begun to see a C-130, and I suspect we'll begin to see C-17s, which can bring in enormous amounts of, of supplies for the civilian population. All of these things now have become, become integrated and interleaved into, a, into an effort to win over and convince the civilian population that indeed the regime is gone and that, that uh, better days are ahead in the, in the very near term but in many ways still the toughest job to do, convincing those uh, civilians that uh, the coalition forces are not invaders, but liberators. Colonel Mike Turner, as always, thanks for your insights. Appreciate it. Thank you. We're going to take a short break. We'll be right back. the developments. One of the troubling headlines, though, this morning was that another 101st Airborne soldier had been killed in combat. It's also troubling because it hasn't been confirmed. This is a Washington Post report in their Sunday edition, but according to the base public affairs office, they've had no official notification. And as the family relation group people will uh, often tell you, if you are a family member of a 101st Airborne soldier or other Army unit, if you haven't had a phone call, that means there is no news. So that report now unconfirmed. Something else that's happened with the 101st Airborne, there were some members of a chemical weapons company that were exploring a warehouse in Iraq yesterday and came across some fertilizer chemicals, also some possible suspected sarin nerve gas agents. They had to be taken off and treated for that. Of course, no serious injuries there. And also, the 101st Airborne very much involved in some of the other operations of rooting out the Iraqi soldiers and of digging in around the Baghdad airport that American forces seized over the weekend. At the fort uh, that you can see back there behind all the green behind me, uh, normal military activity, reserve is still coming through and being deployed. A fair amount of activity at the airport today on post, but base officials say that that's just normal. Chris? Ron Blom at Fort Campbell, Kentucky. Thank you for that update. Now let's check in with MSNBC's Christy Muzumeci at our America's Bravest Wall and to look at some of the U.S. troops serving in Operation Air. All kinds of other people are getting uh, face time on TV and what have you, and General Franks have been very quiet. You have to respect that, particularly as he's had so much success. His forces have done so good, a lot of people would want to get out there and kind of gloat. Instead, he's, uh, he's done a wonderful job of being quiet. Now he's out there visiting uh, the troops that are out there, you know, pushing this war forward. We don't know exactly where he is, but it means something to people out there uh, along that line or even in the forward lines. When a four-star general comes out and says hi to you and shakes your hand and tells you you've done a good job, that has a lot of meaning to the troops. Does it mean that we're close to the end? Well, you know what? The picture we'd all like to see is General Frank standing behind the Iraqi information minister <laughs> while the information minister is denying we're even there. That's yeah, right. I would say it means we're getting closer. And, uh, you know, I mean, believe me, General Franks, when he's airborne, he's at risk. Anybody in the air, I don't mean just him, anybody in the air is at risk over there. Anybody on the ground is at risk as we see these continuing hit and run attacks here. Rockets fired today. Uh, we still know they're shoulder fired. Uh, missiles out there that could be, be uh, being fired at our aircraft. So there's mm -hmm. risk in uh, General Franks going forward. Uh, but, uh, you know, he sees the value of visiting these troops as being much more important than whatever risk he's in front of. Yeah, that, that Iraqi uh, information minister has become kind of a, a, a almost a hapless character, Colonel. I, at what point, though, could we safely declare victory? Uh, I don't know, Bridget. I think even once we've uh, secured the city, and again, I think they're all being careful, the Pentagon and CENTCOM, and they're absolutely right. We are a long way from, from being done with this. Even if we have these popular uprisings, we hope we have. We've still got a long way to go. Uh, but I don't know. I think, you know, uh, the Arab world, until we, they see Saddam in our hands, 
uh, they're always going to kind of feel like Saddam is still there. You know, somewhat like bin Laden. There are people out there who think that bin Laden's uh, mere being alive still means we haven't quite won that war on terrorism. We've not, but we're sure uh, at, a, at a pretty good stage of winning that same thing here. We may right. control 99% uh, of, uh, of Iraq and uh, that 1% that Saddam's sitting in. If we haven't got our hands on him, there are people who are still going to say we've not yet won. So I don't think the yeah. Pentagon, the White House, or CENTCOM are rushing to put the words out uh, that we've won and it's total victory. Yeah, Colonel, uh, just as, as you're talking uh, about the overall picture of Iraq, we've been looking live at, again, the uh, Iraq's second largest city, Basra, in the south, where it seems that the coalition forces are free to move about, uh, with the exception maybe of the old part of that city, where they still have to do some some street-by-street -street, uh, cleanup operations, if you will. Colonel, thank you so much for, for your insights. And just want to uh, toss back briefly to uh, John Scott in Doha. Cutter, John, I know you're going to keep us posted all the developments from CENTCOM through the day, right? Certainly will, Bridget. I cannot stress enough, this campaign is less than 20 days old. And who would have thought, as we woke up here this morning, to see U.S. tanks, uh, Greg Kelly bringing us amazing pictures as they roll into Saddam's palace compound in downtown Baghdad. I'm John Scott at Forward Central Command in Doha, Qatar. Gutter Topper, the gutter protection solution. Beautiful. The clean lines and colors add curb appeal to any home. Safe. No more clumsy ladders or dangerous reaching and stretching. Gutter Topper eliminates the need for gutter cleaning forever. Strong. Independent testing proved. People don't get medical help. Paula? And David Bloom was so young and, as you said, so healthy. 39 years old, soon to be 40. Thanks, Elizabeth. Things Thanks. we all should be aware of. Time to check in with Jack now. Norwich, Kansas, town of 550 people, 20 of them on active duty in the military. And uh, when a reporter showed up out there to do a little story about it, 200 local people showed up and it turned into one great big party. We are a very close-knit town. When I go into places, most of the people know that I'm Chad's wife, and so they'll ask me, you know, how is he doing? When was the last time you heard from him? And just make sure that I'm okay. Norwich, Kansas. They're just getting the crop in out there now. And for people wondering if they're seeing something behind our heads, April 7th, oh, it's man. snowing. Yeah, and there'll be no planting here in New York today. It's no, a not big at all. Blizzard on the Four way. Four to eight here. inches of snow, they say oh, we're going to get. Awful. Have fun getting home today, Jack. Thank you. That wraps it up for all of us here on American Morning. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, we are about to hit the top of the hour, and at that point after the short break, you'll hear the headlines. Thanks again for joining us today. Hope to see you in the morning. oppressed Iraqis terrorized by the brutal leader for decades might now be taking matters into their own hands. And now you're looking live at Baghdad as we get this new report of bloody popular uprisings against Saddam Hussein's most loyal troops. And in the south, in Basra now, you were looking at pictures of the downtown area where we've been seeing teams of British Marines patrolling the area on foot, also in military vehicles, a group of British soldiers appearing on a bridge just a little while ago over a small canal at the city center. They have been patrolling with their helmets off, and we have also been getting reports of a popular uprising underway in that southern city of Basra as well. So the big question, is this regime at the tipping point? Fox News is live with up to the second reports. And the first one of those reports being from our own Major Garrett. He joins us live now from the Pentagon. Major, good morning. Well, good morning, Bridget. Just a, a, an amazing number of bulletins today. Huge events all over the country of Iraq that start in Baghdad. Clearly, the 3rd Infantry Division moved into key psychological aspects of the regime of terror in Baghdad, the presidential palace of Saddam Hussein, a clear signal to the Iraqi people in Baghdad that coalition forces can move where they want to, when they want to. But it remains a very dicey situation. There is fire being exchanged between coalition forces and what remains of Iraqi opposition, army and non-army, paramilitaries and others. 
And there have been casualties on the coalition side. Two Marines dead on the eastern part of Baghdad when an artillery shell slammed into an armored personnel carrier. On the western part of Baghdad, two Army soldiers killed, two journalists killed when a rocket believed to be a Frog 7, that's a free rocket over ground, smashed into a tactical operations center west of Baghdad, continuing fighting, artillery being exchanged, small arms fire being exchanged. The Pentagon is also aware and I will say aware, not confirming, but aware of these reports of potential popular uprisings in the street of Baghdad. The Pentagon is ex exercising tremendous caution about this because they don't know exactly where these popular uprising reports are from, that is to say which parts of Baghdad they're occurring in, and if in fact they are very large in number. The Pentagon saw and reviewed reports of a popular uprising some two weeks ago in Basra. Those reports turned out to be a little bit more optimistic than what actually happened on the ground. So the Pentagon exercising caution, not confirming in any way that they have actual knowledge of a popular uprising in Baghdad, aware of the reports, hoping that they're true, and also hoping that they are not a sign of sort of factional bloodletting on the ground in Baghdad, but something that really is in concert with coalition forces to topple the regime of Saddam Hussein. Let's also go to Basra. Significant developments there. For the first time in two weeks, British forces, as you said, Bridget, not only in Basra, the urban core of that key southern city, the second most populous city in Iraq, but doing so with their helmets off. What does that signal? That signals that British forces for the first time believe that the city has largely been pacified, that they are in control and the threat from paramilitary or Ba'ath Party firing, be it artillery or small arms, has been, if not completely eliminated, dramatically reduced. In between Basra and Baghdad, other significant developments. Coalition control now of the key city Karbala, south of Baghdad. Also, credible reports of a possible weapons of mass destruction site near Hindia. How did coalition forces learn about it? From enemy prisoners of war who tipped them that there might be something worth investigating there. Preliminary reports are that there might be something suspicious there. No confirmation from the Pentagon, but an exploitation team is on site reviewing all what's there. As soon as we have details on that possible chemical weapons facility, we'll bring it to you live. That's the latest from the Pentagon, Bridget. Back to you in New York. All right, Major, so many developments. We certainly will be checking back. Thank you for the update. Now, about the U.S. Marines who've been battling the Iraqi forces and also battling Mother Nature, a sandstorm causing big problems for some of the troops who are still on their way to Baghdad. Let's get a live update now. Colonel Oliver North embedded with the 1st Marine Expeditionary Force. Colonel, good morning. Go ahead. Bridget, the weather has not been kind to us today. We've been overcast in a minor sandstorm, though it is now clearing, signaling once again that this 5th Marine Regiment, the 7th Marines and the 1st Marines, will very likely be crossing the Tigris yet again. Standing next to me, Captain Grayson Story, one of those who saved us yesterday when that UH-1 helicopter behind us was hit by enemy fire, forced to land, instantly surrounded by members of the 1st Light Armored Reconnaissance Battalion. And I want to say on the air, Captain, Thank you. You're welcome. Tell us, what, what, what has it been like for you to be at the gates of Baghdad? Well, it's been great to be about the nation's business on global war on terrorism. And doing a great job of it. Anybody at home you want to say hi to? I can say hi to my family in uh, Westland, Michigan, and uh, Escondido, California, and some parts of North Carolina. Well, I'll also tell you, Bridget, that the news of popular uprisings inside Baghdad has been greeted by the Marines here with great applause. They're grateful that, they, that what they now forecasted long ago is now happening inside Baghdad. Also some good news, Bridget. They can also confirm that killed and captured at the Salman Pak Terrorist Training Center are Jordanians, Syrians, Iranians, and Yemenis. Also, the commander of the Special Republican Guards, that's the group, the uh, chief of staff of the Special Republican Guards, the group commanded by Saddam Hussein's son, Kusay. Good news from this side of the Tigris, Bridget. All right, Colonel Oliver North, want to thank you so much for that update, and we certainly will be checking back. Right now, though, we want to go live to Baghdad. Joining us on the phone is a German reporter, Chris Jumpelt. Uh, Chris, we've been getting a lot of media reports, obviously, that there is a popular uprising underway in the city right now. What have you seen and heard? Absolutely nothing in that context. Unfortunately, I am not able to confirm that in any way. Um, there might, of course, be the possibility for such a thing, uh, because maybe this time the population believes that they will not be uh, left alone, uh, like uh, it was uh, the case in 91. So there is a possibility, of course.
Can you tell us at all what's been going on in terms of information from Iraqi officials? We've seen so much of that information, Minister. What's the latest on that end, Chris? Well, we, the information minister had a short briefing for the uh, foreign media here, and uh, that was also played on Iraqi television in, in full uh, bandwidth. Uh, and uh, a little later on, there was the regular daily military communique read out on Iraqi television and also radio. That, funnily enough, did not mention the city of Baghdad at all for a change. There was no mention whatsoever of the capital in the official daily military communique. Well, that's interesting. That could be pretty significant. Have you seen, Chris, uh, from your perch, any, any evidence of people fleeing the city? We've heard uh, reports that uh, because of this uprising, some of uh, Iraq's military people have been changing into civilian clothes and trying to get out of Dodge. Very possible. Um, I can confirm that I've seen people in civilian clothes today who uh, would normally, on a day like this, be wearing the Ba'ath Party uniform, especially this being the 56th anniversary of the founding of the Ba'ath Party, which still officially rules this country. It was founded in 1947. Um, so they would have more than one reason to actually be wearing that uniform today. But <laughs> some of them are not. All right, Chris Jompelt, as always, thank you very much with his eyes and ears inside Baghdad. And we'll certainly be uh, checking back with you as we continue to get reports of an uprising underway in the Iraqi capital this morning. Uh, now, as we say, we're getting more and more of these reports of ordinary citizens turning on Saddam loyalists. Let's find out what we can now from uh, neighboring Jordan. And we go live now to Fox's Jennifer Eccleston. Jennifer. Hi there, Bridget. Well, it will be interesting to see once we get further confirmation of these reports of uprisings in Baghdad and also in Basra. But in Baghdad, interesting to note and see what neighborhoods that they are specifically referring to. We could and we have long expected and hoped that we would see some sort of popular uprising in Saddam City. That's to the east of Baghdad, and it is where the Shia population live, the Shia sect of Islam. There are 1.5 million Shia Muslims living in Saddam City. There are 16% of the residents of Baghdad are Shia Muslims too. And of course, they are no friend of President Saddam Hussein. They have long been discriminated against by the ruling Sunni um, sect of Islam. And in fact, after the 1991 Gulf War, when there was a popular uprising in Saddam City and also in Basra, which was the majority Muslim um, city to the Shia Muslim city to the south, there was a brutal crackdown by, um, with, by President President Saddam Hussein and his security elements on the Shia populations in those cities and in Saddam City in the east of Baghdad it became a virtual police state and in fact it remains so today we heard reports that he is putting his special Republican Guard paramilitary forces um, rimming, ro putting them outside of uh, Saddam City making sure at least at that stage that there weren't any popular uprisings of course let's go now to some of the developments coming out of Baghdad today. Of course, we saw U.S. forces attacking the seat of Saddam Hussein's authority, the nucleus of his power. This happened early this morning, 6 a.m. local time. Uh, we had A-10 Warthog tank busters demolishing, defending Iraqi armored units on the western approach to the Tigris River. We saw more than 70 U.S. tanks, 60 Bradley fighting vehicles taking part in the raid, column after column of U.S. power taking control of some of the most prominent symbols of Saddam Hussein's ironclad regime. We saw two presidential palaces now in American control. The central parade grounds also in U.S. hands. U.S. forces briefly took uh, defensive positions at two key government buildings in Baghdad, the Ministry of Information and also the Foreign Ministry. Uh, reporters there say, however, those troops have left and Republican Guard and Special Republican Guard units are now patrolling both those ministries. Iraqi forces also blocking uh, many bridges over the Tigris River. We've heard that two of those bridges are damages. They've damaged rather. They've also set alight a number of those oiled filled trenches in an effort to obscure the visibility of the advancing U.S. troops. CENTCOM today also confirming that Iraqi military equipment has been placed at quote unquote sensitive sites. One of those sensitive sites being a mosque in Baghdad. Meanwhile, of course, the propaganda war continues. Iraqi television on air for a number of hours today airing old footage of Saddam Hussein and playing patriotic music 
Iraqi radio um, aired a sermon by a religious leader which was calling on uh, Iraqi forces to rise up against U.S. and coalition forces. And as we've become accustomed to almost on a daily basis, today we also heard from Iraq's information minister, Mohammed Saeed al Sayyaf. He popped up outside of the Palestine Hotel claiming that there were no Americans in Baghdad. He was just a hundred yards away from the advancing U.S. troops. He said American forces were at the gates of Baghdad committing suicide. He said Baghdad was safe and that Iraq will be victorious. Very much a defiance, but also desperation from the Iraqi Minister of Information. Back to you, Bridget. All right, Jennifer Eccleston in Jordan. Jennifer, thanks a lot. And there is word today that coalition forces are closer to uncovering what UN weapons inspectors couldn't. Saddam's arsenal of weapons of mass destruction. U.S. forces reportedly discovering a possible WMD storage site south of the Iraqi town of Hindia. A military source is telling Reuters that there are also unconfirmed reports that they came across sarin at the site. It is believed Iraq used sarin, a deadly nerve agent, against the Kurds back in the 1980s.